1 Peter, the third chapter, beginning at verse 17. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excesses of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries wherein you think it strange, they, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. We'll stop our reading there. You can see that the apostle in the beginning of our passage where we began to read there in chapter three, verse 17, he is here in keeping with his general theme of this epistle. As you know from the very first chapter to the last, he is speaking of living in affliction, our, the trials of our faith, that we're to think it not strange when fiery trials overtake us, but the sufferings that we're to do as the children of God and how we are to be victorious in these and how that God is to use them to our good and to our betterment. So he is keeping to his theme, which began in the very beginning of the epistle, epistle and goes all the way through, exhorting to patience in affliction. And again here in this text, pointing to Christ as the preeminent example that is that we are to follow. He did this also, uh, well, through the epistle, but one place in chapter two, where he says, but if when you do well and you suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. So he is the example that we're to follow and Peter continually holds him up as that example as we're called upon to suffer as well. But let us never, as many are wont to do, uh, forget that Christ's sufferings were not merely done for an example. He wasn't just merely setting an example of patience and self-denial to be imitated by you and me. Concerning the sufferings of Christ, that uh, Peter here refers to, that would be impossible for you and me to follow his example. I think you can see why. We read there, he hath once suffered for sin, not for his own sin. He had no sin, but he suffered for sin as a representative sufferer. So we can never follow that example in suffering. He suffered the just for the unjust. That is, he suffered vicariously. The just for the unjust. We cannot 
suffer. We cannot follow him in that suffering. We can follow the example that he set and the attitude in which he did it, but never in the purpose for which he did it. He suffered that he might bring us to God. He suffered that he might, in other words, reconcile us to God. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. We, he has made peace between our souls and God. He suffered being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit. That is by his, in his divine spirit. He was not dead, he did not die. The flesh did die. But that flesh, the life that it had, was the life that his divine person had given it, and that same life remained in him. He remained that same life, I should say, even though the flesh was put to death. Jesus' sufferings were vicarious, they were meritorious. Though he is our foremost pattern, we know this, he is our foremost pattern for patience in affliction, whose footsteps we are to follow, who did no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth. And yet when he was beguiled, when he was derided, he reviled not again, not in return. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him who judgeth righteously. That is, he put all things in the hands of the Father without any kind of re retaliation on his own part. But Peter's greater point in the text is the representative nature of the sufferings of Christ and not just his representative, representative nature, the representative nature of them, but the fact that he brings together our own life with the life of Christ and our own death to the flesh with the death of Christ, our own death to sin. He ties it in with the death of Christ. Not only so, but on the merits of his death and resurrection, we experience the spiritual likeness of it. We see here in verse one of chapter four, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And clearly Peter argues that because of our union with Christ in his suffering, we must now mortify the deeds of the flesh. He says in, in the Colossian letter, Paul does in the Colossian letter, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Therefore, mortify your members that are upon the earth. Because we're dead with Christ, because we're alive with Christ, because we're in union with him in his death and his resurrection and his life, therefore, because of that, mortify your members which are upon the earth and all of the sin that our members upon the earth commit as he goes on to speak of there. So from the moment that we come to know and experience our oneness with Christ, it is then that old things begin to pass away and all things are becoming new. We are made new creatures in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us. We're made one with him in whom all principalities and powers in heaven and in earth are subject. We see there in verse 22 of chapter three. For you are complete, Paul says, in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. But I want us to notice, and this is our main purpose tonight, all that by way of introduction. Notice in these opening verses, of chapter four, three phrases that have to do with our times, our past, present, and future. Our times, the times of, of an individual, the time of your life, the time of my life, from the time we were born 
until the time is no more. These, the past and the present and the future, he mentions the time past of our life, verse 3, first part of verse 3, the time past of our life. That is before, and he's speaking to Christians, that is before we came to faith in Christ. He's speaking to the time before we became Christians, before we were born again. All of us have a past. All of us have a past life. Before we met the Lord, we had a life then. For some, it was very shameful. Some had a vile past, as we can see here, as he is speaking to those who are not to return to the life that they had before when they walked in lasciviousness and in lust, in, the, in excesses of wine, in revelings and banquetings and abominable idolatries. That was the past life. That was the time past for the life of many of those to whom he was speaking. He even includes himself and uses the inclusive we as he's speaking, Peter does. Now we're, we doubt that Peter was involved in all the various types of vile sins that he mentions that he includes in that black list. But nevertheless, it shows us that we in times past, before we met the Lord, we were sinners and some of us of a very deep dye. Many carry the marks of their past life with them in this body. I've known many, a person saved out of sin, yes, but they had done so much damage to themselves while in sin that they carried the marks of it in their physical bodies. And of course, we all carry the marks of it in our conscience and wish that we could if there was any way that we could go back and erase it and just change it. Of course, that's impossible. But the time passed. All of us have a time past. And then regarding our present, he says, looking back over the days of our unregenerate life, he says that he or we no longer should live no longer should live as we once did. Verse two, the first part of verse two. And then he speaks of the rest of our time. The second half part of verse two, just after that in verse two, look at that again. That you no longer should live the rest of your time in the flesh to the lust of men as the Gentiles live that you should no longer. So Peter argues that once in Christ, the believer no longer should live as he did, as in times past. There must be a change. The new birth brings a great change. We're not what we used to be. Christ came to save his people from their sins, to deliver them out of sin, out of that bondage, out of that prison, and to set us free. So we are not to live as we once did because Christ, he says, has suffered for us. Christ has suffered for our sins, we read there in verse 18 of chapter three. He suffered for our sins. What greater argument is there not to continue in sin than to know that our sins drove the nails that crucified the Lord of glory. Our sins thrust that spear into his side. We are guilty of the death of Christ. And therefore, because he suffered for us, because he suffered for sin, we should not live any longer in those sins. But we're to put to death, he being put to death in the flesh. And every believer is to consider himself as having been put to death with Christ. This is made clear in various places in scripture. Being, therefore being crucified with Christ. 
Paul says, nevertheless, I lived. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That's his argument in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. He said in that same chapter that we are not to live any longer in sin. God forbid. How can they that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's his argument for sanctification. That's his argument for righteousness. There were those that thought if we're saved by grace, then we can just continue in sin. And that just makes grace more to abound. He said, God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And he says here, likewise reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin. And then there is the flip side, but alive unto God. Dead to sin, alive unto God. Death is a pretty solid argument for why we no longer should live as we did in times past. Don't you think? Christ's death, our death with him, death is a pretty solid argument. I suppose as long as men have breath in their bodies, there will be a fierce debate taking place over the death penalty as to its morality. Is it right for us to put people to death? Well, even Christians disagree on this, even though God instituted it. God is the one that demanded that if a man sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. That, uh, that has been from the beginning. But there are those that think that's an immoral thing, that we do not have the right to do that, that that kind of putting to death is the same as murder, which it isn't. That's a judicial act. But the debate goes on. But I think even the fiercest opponent of the death penalty must admit that it does render it impossible for that person to return to a life of crime. When a murderer is put to death, he's not going to murder again. We know that it puts an end to that life of crime. Is not the same thing true regarding us? If we are dead with Christ, if we've died to the old man, if we've died to sin, then we cannot live any longer therein. We don't return to it again. That is the idea. That is the, the point that is being made. Now, as we'll see, we know that we do not live perfectly free from sin. We, there's still another factor, another aspect to be considered here, and that is that we still live in a body of flesh. We're still in this body. And it, there is a law in our members that wars against the law of our mind. We know that to be true. So we're, we will one day be completely delivered from this body of death, but not yet. So we still have to contend with sin. We are not perfectly eradicated from all of that old flesh and of sin. We are still tempted. And that's the whole thing. That's the whole point of Peter's letter. He's talking about these temptations, these testings that we go through, and the sufferings that we suffer because of sin, and many because of the stand that we take against sin. But we're not eradicated from the flesh. Yet, as the hymn writer said, dying with Christ by death reckoned mine, living with Jesus a new life divine. Looking to Jesus till glory doth shine, moment by moment in this present life, moment by moment, day by day, O Lord, I am thine. Now, because Christ has suffered, Peter says to us, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. In this, we see that Christ 
in his suffering is indeed our example. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what he says in Philippians 2.5, concerning his humiliation and his suffering and his death. He, uh, he was a servant of servants, and that's the point that's being made there. But the mind of Christ, we're to have that same mind who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. We're to have that same mind. When he suffered, he threatened not. We're to have that same mind. We're to commit it, our keeping, and our whole case. We're just to commit it to him who judges righteously. That is to God. Uh, Paul says in another place that we are not to take vengeance ourselves, but as it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So therefore we are not to avenge ourselves, he says, but we're to have that mind of Christ, who when he was reviled, didn't revile in return. And when he, when he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he submitted, submitted to God's will in it. But we must be of the same mind with him as he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem and to die, we must set ourselves like a flint to endure whatever has to be endured, just as he did. This Christ-like mind, this Christ-like mindset is therefore determined to experience the mortification of the flesh. It's determined in that experience to mortify, therefore, our members which are upon the earth. We must be the same mind of Christ because though we reckon ourselves dead, as he says here, the death blow has been delivered. So we reckon ourselves dead. We are not yet delivered from the body of death. But thank God we will be someday. Paul speaks to that. He talked about how that he wasn't yet delivered, that he still had to wrestle with the flesh. He still had to wrestle with the old man every day of his life. He said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But he had the answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's what we look forward to and that shall happen. Not as yet, however, but we reckon ourselves, he says, dead indeed to sin. So Peter asserts that the time past of our life was long enough to have served sin. We, that was a long enough time of service in sin. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. The time past of our life will su suffice us to have walked in sin. No more. The time past is enough. Would any true believer argue otherwise? Anyone who's truly born of God, would we raise an, oh, I don't agree with that, Peter. Time past in my life wasn't long enough in sin for me. What born-again soul would ever argue that way? Matthew 1.21 says that his name is Jesus because he will save his people from, he will save his people out of their sins. He will save us out of the captivity that we were in. He is the one who leads captivity captive. He will save us from the prison house of our sin. He will set us free from that. What, what believer, what slave would want to go back and put, his, put himself back into the, the labors and the grueling work of the taskmaster and put himself in that position again once he had been delivered from the house of bondage why would he ever want to go back? The person that's been freed from the prison, from prison, 
does he want to go? And they locked me back up. I didn't have enough time in there. No. No, we've been delivered from, from the prison house. We've been delivered from the house of bondage. And we don't want to go back. No, no believer, no true Christian would ever argue with what Peter says here, that the time past of our life was long enough. We don't want to go back to that life. How shall they that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Paul's question. The truly regenerate soul will look back on his past, not with longing. Oh, I wish I could go back there again. But with bitter regret with much shame. The past, the time past is just that. It's, it's time past. We can't go back and change anything we've done. And we wouldn't go back to what we were. Paul said, even of his spiritual attainments, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things that are before, I press toward the mark and truly, certainly, if we say that about our past spiritual attainment, attainments, we say that about our life of sin. We don't want to go back to that, forgetting those things that are behind and looking forth to the things that are before us. A life of usefulness to Christ, a life of honesty and integrity and holiness forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things that are before. The time past of our life will suffice. I think I detect in this line a, a touch of irony, don't you? Yes, whatever amount of time it was that we walked in sin, that should suffice. A sufficient number of years were wasted. That's enough. We don't want to go back and waste more. A sufficient amount of harm has been done. We don't want to go back and do more harm. A sufficient degree of shame has been brought. We don't want to go back and bring more. A sufficient number of lives have been ruined no more. Yes, we agree with him. The time past is long enough. That will suffice. We don't want to go back to that. So he concludes that the rest of his time, the rest of the believer's time, must be lived for God. In verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. As a Christian, we can say that our life is divided into two parts, just like history is divided into two parts, B.C. and A.D., before Christ and the year of our Lord. Your life and mine, if you're a believer and I'm a believer, our lives are divided in two before Christ came into them and after he came into them. And my, there ought to be a drastic difference, a stark contrast between the time past of our life and that which we now have in Christ. There was the time past before we met Christ and then there's the rest of our life. Our past, you see, was only time. Too much time lived in sin, but our past was time. But in Christ, since Christ has come in, it is life. Our past without Christ was only time spent, but now we have begun to live. No one begins to live until Christ come in, comes into his life. Living the rest of our days in him.
You didn't live until Christ came. You only bided time. But since he came into your life, life has begun. So the rest of our life, we're not going to live it in the sins of the flesh. We're going to live it unto God. That's what we've been saved to do. And the time past of our life is more than enough to have spent in sin. The rest of our life must be lived to the will of God. There's not a minute to waste, not a moment to lose. As long as we have our being, let us live the rest of our life to the will of God. Because we all know that our time passed before we knew Christ. That'll suffice for having lived in sin. The rest of our life belongs to him. The rest of our life is to be lived to the will of God.